welcome to another episode of Nonstop Nick Hill. Today is a new day here in Cape Town and I'm checking out the Bokap area, which isn't far from downtown, but again, you feel like you're in a completely different world here. So we're here to learn a little bit more about the history of the Cape Muslim or Cape Malay community and exactly why they're called that, what their identity is and how they're living today. But right now we're in front of one of the first madrasas here and then also one of the first mosques and I'm here with my host uh, Rafiq, aptly named Rafiq, R Rafiq mean com companion here, yeah yeah he's, he's my Rafiq here <laughs> here in Bukap uh, and it's amazing because he's telling me that this was actually his great 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 grandmother yeah Sarki from, from the Kaab was actually involved in establishing this first mosque. It's literally called First Mosque. Oh, well, Masjid. Yeah, it was the Tuanguru <laughs> who established the first mosque, and she actually uh, donated this land as Wakaf property yeah. for the first mosque to be built on. Yeah, so I'm here because I wanted to learn more about the Cape Muslim, Cape Malay community after I was really confused when Ziad told me yesterday that he's Malay and I didn't really know what that meant whether it meant he was uh, actually from Malaysia or he said he's, it's, he identifies as Cape Malay because he's Muslim and so far what I've learned is that the whole Malay word here isn't actually a reference to Malaysia at all but rather it was a reference to the Malay language which was the, the lingua franca of the Indian Ocean trade be it in Southeast Asia, South Asia or along the Indian Ocean coast of Africa and as that became the language of trade it also became the sort of identity marker placed on the people from the Dutch colonies in this part of the world who were then enslaved by the Dutch and brought here to South Africa. Due to the fact that a lot of Due to the fact that almost all of the early Muslims here in South Africa were enslaved people, that meant that they weren't in conversation with Muslims in other parts of the world. Even in their home countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia, along the other coasts of Africa. So the Islam here developed and evolved with its own culture, its own traditions, and its own way of doing things. This was sometimes apart from the Orthodox Islam practiced in other parts of the Middle East. Much of the early Islam here in South Africa is Sufi Islam. Clearly the Dutch didn't like those who could undermine their political influence or their socio-cultural influence. And these were mostly Muslim Sufi leaders. And on the topic of Islam here in the Cape, uh, Rafiq is telling me about how practicing your religion, whether it was Islam, whether it was Hinduism, it was a form of rebellion against Dutch uh, colonialism and injustice. What they really wanted was to strip everybody of their identity and that meant taking away your name, taking away your religious practices, taking away your traditions. However, people always found a way around that attempt. So even though the Dutch would give enslaved people very generic names such as the days of the week or the months of the year, or very generic biblical names like Rafiq's last name is, is Jacob's in an attempt to strip his family of their connection to um, other parts of the world and their religion and their identity, there were still ways to circumvent that. So people would have music and they would, and the Dutch would just think it was folk songs and they would be like, okay, just let them do it. It's, it's nothing that will harm us. And they would also send a lot of political prisoners uh, from other parts of their territories around the world here to Cape Town. And a lot of those figures were religious figures. Uh, such as uh, Sheikh uh, Yusuf uh, al Makasi al Makasi of Makas of Ma of Makasa, yeah. <laughs> such as the most prominent figure Sheikh Sheikh Yusuf of Makasa, who was brought here and then helped Islam to flourish in this part of the Cape. The Muslim communities here then realized that their practices, which had sustained them for so long, being passed on from father to son as imams were straying so far from traditionally acknowledged forms of fiqh or, jurist or Islamic jurisprudence that they needed to bring in a religious teacher from Turkey to reinstate the different types of madhahib or schools of thought and fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence for the community here in Cape Town. As with all freedom struggles, these Muslims had to work really hard 
to fight the colonial powers in order to gain their freedom of religion. This often meant entering into negotiations with the European powers in order to uh, provide labor in return for the right to exercise their freedom of religion. In one particular episode, the Dutch actually promised the Muslims that they would get their freedom of religion as well as a mosque built here in Cape Town if they only aided the Dutch soldiers in their fight against the occupying British. When the British finally arrived and it was time to fight, it was the Muslim soldiers who were actually left fighting on the battlefield because they actually had something to fight for. So even though the British won the battle, they, they said that they were so impressed by the Muslims' courage to keep fighting that they would fulfill the promises of the Dutch. However, though they received freedom uh, to practice their religion, the mosque was never built. It was not until many years later that that first mosque, the Awul Masjid, was built and Muslims had a place to formally practice their religion. As I said before, the Malay in Cape Malay has nothing to do with modern day Malaysia. Uh, all those lines drawn on the map from Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, those are all just colonial distinctions. The Malay has to do with the fact that Malay was the lingua franca of the Indian Ocean trade. So the Cape Malays who were enslaved in other Dutch territories and brought here to Cape Town, they might be from Southeast Asia, they might actually be from Java, uh, from Sumatra, from Malaysia, and so on. They might be from Ceylon, Sri Lanka, they might be from India, they might be from Mozambique, they might be uh, from the, they might be from current day Tanzania. I actually asked uh, Rafiq where his family is from and he told me he did one of those DNA tests. And, but for him, it was only maybe 1% Malaysia. A lot, he had a large percentage, about a third from India, and then the rest from Southeast Asia, some from the coasts of Africa. And so that's really what the yeah. Cape Malay or Cape Muslim identity entails. It encompasses so much of the world, so much of the world which was brought here to Cape Town due to the impact of colonialism by the Dutch. At the same time, I'm revising a bit of what I've said in previous videos about the Afrikaans language. Its current day association is largely with the white South Africans. Afrikaans is heavily associated with the apartheid regime. Yet, its roots go back much, much farther. Rafiq tells me that the Creolized Dutch, which makes up Afrikaans, actually goes back to before the Cape Muslims or Malays even made their way here to South Africa. In fact, many of the Creolized Dutch words used here in South Africa resemble words used in, in, in other Dutch territories in Southeast Asia, such as Indonesia. I've heard from many brown and black South Africans that growing up they despised having to learn Afrikaans as one of the official languages due to its association with the apartheid regime. However, the reality is that it was actually a language of the brown and black people, especially of the Cape Malays who used it before they even got here and used it as a mode of communication unique to them and their cultural heritage. I'm talking so much about the Dutch today. I'm talking so much of Southeast Asia today, even though I'm at the southern tip of the African continent. But why is that? It goes back to the geography. It goes back to imperialism. This is because before the Suez Canal, if you wanted to make your way from Europe to South Asia and Southeast Asia, you would have to go all the way around the southern tip of Af Africa, which is not Therefore, far. Therefore, the British and the Dutch were fighting over control of the southern tip of Africa in order to control the access point to Asia for the spice trade. Due to the trade between Dutch and British territories here in South Africa and in Asia gave way to a whole new cuisine and you can taste that cuisine here in the Bukap area of Cape Town. This cuisine is characterized by a heavy use of spices, however, in a more mild fashion, which is palatable to Dutch and British tastes, as well as the more evolved tastes of South Africans centuries after their ancestors were forced out of Asia. In the 21st century, you can't help but talk about gentrification in this area of Bukam. Rafiq told me that there's been a strong movement to protect the cultural heritage in this part of Cape Town. 
geographically it doesn't sit far from the more upscale parts of town it doesn't sit far from downtown areas it doesn't sit far from the business centers of cape town in fact it's only a short walk away but you can already see the area being encroached by condo buildings by high rises by everything that can destroy the cultural heritage of the cape malays here in cape town rafiq described his neighborhood as one that is safe one in which children could play outside walk around without fear that a neighborhood in which everybody knows everyone and which is anchored by their shared faith in Islam. You could already hear the, the Azan playing behind me in one of my previous scenes. However, due to the beautiful colors on the streets here that people have painted to show pride in their neighborhood, that means that there are, is a lot of tourist foot traffic in this neighborhood. That means that there is a desire for development by more wealthy segments of South African society. It means that there are other people who are seeking that neighborhood vibe and want to buy property here. And all of that results in gentrification in which Cape Malays are sometimes being forced out if, not, if their building is not just being demolished in this neighborhood. And back during the global Black Lives Matter campaign, there was a Bukap Matters campaign here in which roads were blocked, tires were lit, there was a massive non-violent protest here um, in which people would break their fast on one of the main streets here as a show of solidarity and support for the neighborhood and for what it stands. With that, I'm gonna try to find some lunch now because I'm pretty hungry. I think it's past 2 p.m. at the moment. I asked Rafiq what were some like local spots owned by local people here because sometimes it's really hard to figure out or distinguish which businesses in the neighborhood are owned by white South Africans and which ones are owned by local people uh, from the neighborhood. He gave me two spots. There's one right in front of me. I'm going to go check that one out and uh, let's see what we're going to eat today. Hopefully some good Cape Malay food. I was just speaking about the historical Spice Street, but behind me you have a very clear example of the current day Spice Street, which is still happening in this neighborhood. There's this Atlas Spice Trading Company behind me, and they just have bags and bags and bags of spices, fennel seeds, coriander seeds, all sorts of stuff, and they're all, say, made in India. So the current day Spice Street is alive and well.